just a second. <laughs> That's funny. Hang on just a second. I need to edit my um my iTunes list here just for just a minute. I'll be painting in just a second. Okay. Hello, gang. Welcome. And I need to turn that music. I've got music going on in the background to keep me from going nuts. But I'm trying to keep it soft enough so that you can hear what's going on. Thanks for joining me. Um, I've decided to entitle this <laughs> for one of how to get better at stuff. <laughs> that gives me permission to go anywhere. Um, but let me zoom in here just for a minute. Hey, Patrick. Yeah, it does remind you of school days, doesn't it? I told these kids last week. I started this painting last Wednesday, and I it was there this school, elementary school in, in my hometown. It was their fine arts emphasis, and the PTA graciously paid me to come and do a painting. I think this is the sixth time, the sixth number six school in in this town in Raleigh that I have uh, painted and for the school. And that really excites me. Um, the thought of this painting hanging up in the hallway for 10, 20, 30 years and being able to influence tens of thousands of students. That really thrills me. Uh, anyway, let me talk about, I'm painting, I've got, uh, what, I'm about 85, 90% done with this painting, but um, 85 maybe. Um, and I was painting this tree a minute ago and I was looking at, I've got a photograph here. I've got two of them. One is, as you can see, up here, just stuck there, and, and another one is laminated in my hand. And uh, actually, this they're taking it slightly different times. So that one up there is slightly better, so I'm going to go by that one. Um, I, was, I mixed up a color and started painting. I wasn't sure that I was going to do, you know, work on this tree or not, but now I'm very gl glad that I decided to do it. But while I was doing it, it dawned on me. Wait a minute. Wait. This 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 could be a good, this could be a good broadcast a teaching opportunity, because I found my brain, I found my mind, doing things. Um, it, your your brain does it. Everybody's does it. But I I, I I'm that if there's a difference, not <laughs> not between my brain and yours, but if there's a maturity that has come to me in my development as an artist is an awareness of things. It's not just my mind is working, but I'm aware of what, aha, this is what I'm doing. So that's what I want to share with you. So as I was painting this tree, first of all, what color is it? How do I decide what color? Well, the answer is I look at the photograph. That's the answer. And then how do I decide where to put these highlights? Now, of course, the light's coming from this way. You don't get any credit for that. That's You, you can get disqualified for screwing up, but you don't get points for getting that right that that we expect the artist to get that you don't get any credit for are you, are you with me for getting the question right which way is the light coming from um but as i was painting and here's what's happening i am looking again repeatedly and carefully at this photograph of course you can see a shadow of a branch that's kind of cool and I'm, i want to indicate that here i've already got it in the underpainting i've already got hinted at um but as my mind was going back and forth and back and forth by the way i'm going to do just a little bit of scratching to increase the the bark like texture I, you know in my style of painting i'm not going to go nuts trying to render bark are you with me that what i just did right there is probably good enough but I'm going back and forth, and I'm looking at the photograph. Here's the, the key thing. How do you get better at stuff? At, at, of course, I'm talking about art stuff. How do you get better at art stuff? How do you get better at painting? The answer is by looking. And I, can't, I cannot say that word strongly enough. You get better at painting by looking um as again let me zero in on this photograph for you for just a second as i looked at it i i asked myself okay and where is the lightest brightest whitest part of this tree and it turned it turns out yeah it's classic 
it's not, the lightest spot is not right on the edge of the tree. The lightest spot is in a little bit. Um, so when I say, how do you get better? By looking. Now let me conflate that a little bit and say, by looking carefully, by looking again and again and again. Uh, here's a process that I have just become aware of, I think, in the last six months, that many times the difference between the pretty good artists among us and the really good artists among us, are you with me? The difference often is that the really good artists keep on paying close attention to their subject longer than the pretty good artists. The really good artists continue to study and notice things, carefully noticing things in their subject that the pretty good artists uh, it's easy to it's easy for me to act out of to demonstrate here's how most of us paint too much of the time we're painting a tree right oh i'm painting a tree when you get that attitude by the way oh i'm painting a tree that means you're no longer painting from what you're looking at you're painting on your reference file this great big huge file cabinet in your brain that has a million images in it now, if you're really not an artist at all, you're not even, that's not a reference file. It's a um, SSSOS pa file, which is Super Simple Survival Oriented Symbols, or SOS for short, Survival Oriented Symbols. Our brain, and this is my, this is what I teach, a huge part of what I teach in drawing class. Um, uh, our, our eyes, keep us alive by burning as little energy, few calories as possible to get the job done. In other words, our, our eyes are invented to be lazy. Did you get that? And when I say our eyes, I really mean the visual part of our brain. Our eyes do their job by helping us navigate through three, a three-dimensional world as easily as possible. In order to do that, our, our brain is genius at turning everything in our world into SSSOSs. <laughs> Super simple, survival-oriented symbol. That's what your brain is full of. And um, when, you, when you, as an artist, say, Oh, I'm going to paint a tree. <laughs> I hope, hope you can... In other words, you're not studying. You're just, Oh, I'm just going to paint a tree. You're painting probably an SSSOS or... SOS for short, survival oriented symbol. Um, this is what non artists do. That's why the big part of my t drawing uh, class is is focused on people. The reason people can't draw is because they literally do not, do not, do not see what their eyes are pointed at. And I'm not being poetic or exaggerated. I'm speaking very strictly accurately. People literally do not see what their eyes are pointed at because they don't need to. Uh, in order to survive, all you need to do is take a quick glance and your brain in a, in a millisecond turns everything in your field, everything that you need to pay attention to, turns it into an SSSOS or super simple survival oriented symbol. And uh, as artists, we need to, we have to, to the degree that you've learned to fight against that tendency, to that degree you become a good artist or a good drawer, I should say, if you're doing realism. Okay? Now, let me expand that just a little bit because if you follow me at all. Hey, Edward, thank you, man. Appreciate it. I appreciate your comment earlier to, today or yesterday, too. Uh, if you follow me at all, you, you know that most of the time I'm, I'm, sort, of, I'm sort of ragging on, I'm picking on uh, realists. Are you with me? I, I don't think that super realism is the is the is the best way to do art. I'm going to do say I'm going to say something right now that sounds as though I'm contradicting that, and it is this: you can never go wrong. I should say you can never go far wrong if you're doing accurate realism. So I never belittle, look down on, diminish. 
anybody who's doing realism. Are you with me? It, you, can, you can never go wrong. If you're doing realistic stuff, you're doing good. I believe the best way to paint is to learn how to do super duper realism and then, and then add impressionistic uh, abstract painting on top of that. Certainly ha that has been my journey. Um, that's why when I tease some realists sometimes and they say, I used to paint that way, and then I took pills and got over it, is my, the rest of the joke. Well, the, the only reason it's kind of funny is that it's kind of true. Uh, for decades, uh, as a young man and then as an illustrator, um, I did very realistic work. You can still see some of that. You can see it on my portrait page, my automotive page, and my illustration page at danmelsonart.com. Um, you can ne you'll never go wrong if you're doing super duper realism, okay? And if that's as, in a sense as far as you go with your art, that's just fine. Um, my my biggest concern is the the group of the wide group of artists who can't who don't develop their chops enough to do realism, so they just do impressionistic stuff, and they pretend that that's what they meant to do. What they re what's really going on is they they fell short of realism and they shot an arrow and then drew a target around where the arrow landed they, they say oh no no I, I do impressionistic art i swear this is this is true in fact I, I know some some you know artists that are moderately well known who say they do impressionistic or they do surrealistic stuff when really all they are is too lazy to to develop the chops to do realism because it it, it takes a form of, by the way, this is a birdhouse on this, on this uh, tree here. Anyway, the point is, how do you get better at stuff? <laughs> by looking, by looking, by looking. And the difference between many pretty good artists and really good artists, again, I'll talk about some of my favorites, like Richard Schmidt. What is it that's so good about him? The answer is, one of the, one of the key answers is, he you can tell when he, he he looks at his subject matter really, really carefully. Where somebody like me, for instance, might at some point quit looking. Say, ah, you know, from here on it's just a tree. Okay? Does that make sense? Um, so don't quit looking. Uh, I'm just about done with that tree. I, I'm, I might have overdone it while I was talking to you guys. Sometimes I get distracted. Let's talk about the rest of the painting now. Uh, as I did this painting, most of it, last Wednesday. Today is Thursday, so this is eight days ago. I, I set up my easel outside Fred Olds Elementary School in downtown Raleigh. And I actually was out there painting for nine hours. It was a long day, and I'm a little embarrassed to tell you the truth. I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't get more done, that I didn't finish the painting. By the way, that's a clear indication that I did something wrong. <laughs> that I got bogged down in at some point. And clearly I did. I, there was no question. In fact, I'll show you. I, I, exactly, when I got home that night, let me see if this whole automatic exposure fix this a little bit. Come on, get dark, get dark. There we go. Okay, I want you to see all the way over here. One of the mistakes that I made last Wednesday is when I started doing the details in this window, this is dumb. I know better than this. I was kind of kicking. I've recovered it now, but when I started these, all these mullions, it's all the lines in the windows. For some reason, I started way over here and worked this way, which was stupid. I should have started at the focal point and worked out. Let me see that gesture again. I should have started at the focal point, which is up here, and worked out like rings of a, of a target uh, so that I could make these mullions fairly realistic, but the further I got away, I should have gotten more abstract. I didn't do that. So I made a mistake of starting way over here, and I started too literal. So yesterday, I fixed most of this by finishing out this red Japanese maple tree that's in front of that building. So that, that softened all of that, and I think it's okay now. Um, hang on just a second. Do you need me? I just was going to play with the video. Um, if you can continue without me for a while, that'd be good. Then I'll keep broadcasting. I will. Uh, I, the landscaping cameras were four fifty-seven a piece, but they had them on sale for three for ten dollars, so I got three. Fantastic. Good. Thank you, man. All right. Appreciate it. Yeah. That, 
ladies and gentlemen, that's my buddy Doug, who comes and works on, works for me, all kinds of, if you've seen my fancy easel, I should have showed you Doug a second ago, um, if you've seen me out, out on the street with my modified easel, Doug is uh, my right hand man, handyman for modifying stuff. He and I work, do it together, and two brains are usually better than one. Okay, so I made a mistake by having too literal over here. All the mullions was too accurate. I've, I have since fixed that mostly by putting this, by putting shadows and highlights and a tree in front of it. Okay, so I'm, I'm down to the point now, and in this room, I can't raise, I cannot raise the, uh, the, the, the easel. This, I'm in my upstairs studio, by the way. I'm a very blessed man. <laughs> I have two studios, one upstairs and one down. Um, um, hang on just a second. I need to think for a second while I, I need to ignore you for a minute while I paint. Okay, so much of the painting is finished. The, the only large area that I have yet to finish is the bottom part, it is down here where all the children are, right? This is all kids. You can kind of tell, if I zoom in there, you can sort of tell that there's there are figures there. And I have a couple, again, a couple different photographs uh, of children. So that gives me a little bit of things to go by. And the mistake though, that I'm going to try to avoid <laughs> is uh, messing up the composition. Again, let me get this to automatically adjust. There we go. Um, I think when I'm finished this painting, this area up here should remain the focal point. This area second and this area third. So the temptation, while I'm doing these children down here, the temptation and I'm glad to have you guys watching me because sometimes you force me to think out loud. And I'm slapping myself. Okay, Nelson, be careful. This is what you don't want to do. You don't want to pull too much focus. That's a theater term, right? There's there, in a in a scene in in drama on stage. There the 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 audience is supposed to be looking at, you know, the, the star of the scene, and an immature actor will sometimes pull focus by not knowing how to uh, act in a supportive role. And uh, that's a good term for, for painters as well. So I want to be careful not to pull too much focus down here, which means, are you with me? But I, but at the same time, I want more. I want this to look like a a front yard sidewalk full of elementary students. You with me? So how am I going to do that? Well, the number one way I'm going to do that is not. See, here's what what some artists would think. Oh, so you're going to keep these. Uh, really abstract or really loose? And the answer is, yeah, kind of. But here's where that, that mindset, here's where that mindset will usually lead the artist. Is instead of abstract or loose, they'll say, they'll, inside their mind, they'll, they'll be saying, so I can paint these figures down here really sloppy. Are you with me? And that would not be the right answer. Um, abstract, you bet. Abstract, certainly. But not bad drawing. I cannot have children down here with heads the size of pumpkins. I can't have children down here that look like they all escaped from a freak show. Are you with me? I can't. That would be a disaster to have all kinds of physical anomalies happening. It just wouldn't work. It would not look right. It would not look good. So I'm going to keep from pulling focus. Again, use that word. I'm going to avoid pulling focus, not by painting these figures messy, 
messily, <laughs> but by keeping the values muted, the light dark, the colors and the values fairly flat. I'm not going to let anything down here get really, really bright. I'm not going to let any colors get really intense. There'll just be hints of color. Of course, kids are wearing all kinds of colors on their clothing. But if, if, a guy's got, if a kid has a fire engine red shirt on in this painting, it's not going to be fire engine red because that would just draw too much attention. Does that make sense? So um, composition, of course, always gets priority over accuracy or realism. Uh, but you don't want to sacrifice realism in order to get composition. But can I make that speak? What's the word? Ironically, can I speak ironically for a minute? Um, so rather than having bad drawings of children, I'm going to try to do fairly decent. I want the anatomies to be believable. It's definitely abstract. But not with, you know, I don't want any kid to have an arm that's three feet long. I don't want a kid to have a body that's, you know, skinny as a telephone pole. And I, I say all this with some passion because I think I used to paint this way a lot more. I used to confuse um, abstraction with sloppiness. That's a good way to put it. Let me say that again. I used to confuse abstraction with sloppiness and then I look again I did I showed you this yesterday let me pick up here's how I learned how to get better one of the ways to get better is to look at paintings you admire I put these pages together yesterday and talked about them quite a bit Jeremy Mann not so much him let's look at Tibor Nagy yes now I know this is way too small uh, T-I-B-O-R N-A-G-Y, Tibor Negi, Eastern European artist, fabulous artist. And he does a lot of cityscapes, and in his cityscapes, he has a lot of people. And I know that's way too small for you to see. But his people are very abstract, are you with me? But very accurate. That's the key concept I want you to understand. There's a difference between abstraction and sloppiness. Uh, here, now backing up quite a bit, getting a lot, lot more realistic, G. Harvey. Very, very, very highly respected and famous collector artist. Um, likewise, figures, his figure, he, he, put, he does his figures a lot more realistically than I do. I don't want to do mine this finished. But again, accurate even in the distance, even though they're abstract, they're accurate. I hope you can get the difference. Uh, Richard Schmid, he does this beautifully. I only see one figure right here. So that's not a good example. That's good enough for now. So again, I'm, I look at people. The reason I laminated those, printed them out, is because like, hmm, I'm gonna look at. I want to have these close to me for for a seat for a while. And I also think I could probably use those pages when I'm teaching uh, some painting classes. Um, the difference between I'm just repeating myself here. The difference between sloppiness and abstraction. Abstraction, good. Sloppiness, hmm, not so good. And many times artists uh, uh, confuse those two goals. They do something sloppy and say, yeah, I meant to do that. Um, now, let me talk about how to do, how I paint figures just for a few minutes. And then I'm gonna end this broadcast. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna show you all this. Um, well, I'll show you a little, <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and switch gears here real quick, midstream, because I want to show you how to paint abstract figures. Abstract, but accurate, okay? That's the term I would like. I wish somebody had slapped me 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, goodness, I, and say, no, 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 Danny, <laughs> here's what you need to understand. Abstraction is not the same as sloppy. And, and Ken, I know you hear some passion in my voice because I see this kind of thing done all the time. They thought they were being abstract when in fact they were just being lazy. Now, the, by the way, um, 
I can't take forever and ever and ever to paint this, not only because of finances, because, you know, I need to get this out the door, delivered and paid, um, but also because if I take too long, I'm probably overdoing it. But I want to demonstrate. So what I just did now is I mixed up. Hang on just a second. Let me show you my my palette. Um, by the way, just for what it's, this is a, a store-bought easel that I modified. One of the things I did is I nailed a piece of cord around. This is like stuff that goes uh, on the floor. Uh, this is actually two pieces of wood with a little gap underneath it. And then I took a, a bead of hot glue and ran it all along the, the edge of this palette so that this sits right under there and the, the hot glue holds it on. Does that make sense? Anyway, all this kind of stuff you do just to get the job done. Okay, back to the painting. Uh, what I want to demonstrate for you is how to, how do you paint anything that's a, a highly complicated, like this a playground full of kids is certainly qualifies as complicated. And the answer is in layers, in stages. So I'm going to go back and forth and back and forth between dark layers and light layers. Does that make sense? Uh, right now I'm painting dark. So in a sense, I'm painting the, the positive uh, image of the children. In a, a few minutes ago, I was painting the light in between the children. And I'm going to go back and forth and back and forth. And remember, the dark paint is always transparent and the light is always opaque. Okay, so when you go back and forth. So I'll be going back and forth and back and forth. See, you can see this one figure right here. Let's pick this as an example. Right here, I will do, I just, I just did some dark. Now let's come back and do a little bit more light around him. And a him or her, I don't know which, it's if it's a him or a her yet. Um, defining little by little, I don't, hang on, I don't want those outliers of white there. Defining him or her little by little, and honestly, much of the time, playing, playing a game that you're all familiar with. Uh, it's the pictures in the clouds game. Um, if we lay on the, as kids, we lay, I hope you still do it as an adult, but you, you lay on the grass Look up at this fluffy cumulus cloud and say, oh, and look for pictures. You with me? That's what I call pictures in the clouds. And um, I'm looking for a figure here. I'm looking for, oh, yeah, that looks kind of like a, an upper arm there. Um, what was that? That was a scribble. Um, so that's that's not too bad right now. I'm going to leave it. Go focus on something else for a while. Um, I will probably come in at a later time. I'll go ahead and do it now. I'll probably come in at a later time and mix up a generally a flesh tone paint and do some arms and probably some legs. A lot of the kids were wearing shorts last uh, Wednesday when I was there. So all of a sudden, that yeah, that's looking a lot more like a kid, and and again, it, 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 his head is not as big as a watermelon, right? That looks like a child. No. Okay, I'll finish. <laughs> Hang on, I'll do one more thing before I leave you, just to show you. I'm, I'm happy with the, I'm happy enough with the anatomy of that child, that one figure. Again, the thing I'm trying to point out right now is abstract is not the same as sloppy or messy. Abstract is abstract, but not messy. So the last thing I'll do with several of these kids is put color on their clothing. So I'm going to give this guy a red, or girl, I don't know which it is. It looks like he's got his hands in his pockets, right? You can ask me, did you do that on purpose? Did you make it look like he or she has his hands in her pockets? The answer is not exactly. It was halfway through the process and went, oh, wait a minute. It looks like this kid has his hands in his pocket. So I went with it. I, I went, yeah, well, yeah, let's finish it out that way. So that's probably enough. Uh, I don't want to add color down there because I think that would draw too much attention. But as you can see, that's sort of a muted figure. The uh, muted color. 
and that's the way I want. I don't want a lot of brightness or contrast down here because if I do that, it will pull focus too much from the real focal point of this painting, which come on, adjust, adjust color. There we go. The real focal point of this painting, I believe, is up here at the top. It's important down here at the bottom, but I don't want it to distract too much. Okay. Yeah, I like that little guy. I think he, that is this person right here. So that's a good example. I hope, I hope that's helpful to you. Abstract, abstract or impressionistic does not equal sloppy. Now I said, look at it now. His head's a little high, so I'll probably carve down the top of his head just slightly. And I spent too much time on this one figure. I'm not, I don't plan to do that for the other 60 characters. I hope to render them more quickly than I did. Okay, hope that's helpful. Hope that's fun. Hope that's entertaining. Um, I may come back and do another broadcast later today. I'm not sure. I absolutely have to finish this painting today. And uh, I should be able to do that without too much trouble. But thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. Please leave comments. And uh, if you like it, subscribe. Let your artist friends know about me. And uh, I'll be back soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Hello. So it turns out I, I am coming back for another to finish this particular broadcast. Uh, and this part of the broadcast is definitely about abstracting figures in a scenic painting. So I don't want to want to be clear here. I'm not talking about doing a figurative painting. Even a, a, some figurative paintings like my friend uh, uh, Don Hatfield out in California. Look him up, Don Hatfield. We painted for a week and we're going to sound like like we sound like a big shot for a minute. Painted with him in France a couple years, five, six years, seven years ago. Great guy, love him. Just got along great. Um, and uh, boy, such a different different way of painting than what I do. But like him a, a lot. Uh, anyway, he does figurative paintings, even though they're mostly mothers and children on the rocks at the beach. That's Don Hatfield. Okay, but I call what he's doing. I call it a figurative painting. What I'm doing here is the, the figures are very much subservient to the scene. This is not a figurative painting, but it's got a bunch of figures in it. I do a lot of this kind of thing because I end up doing a lot of festivals. And in this case, it's a, a playground in front of a bunch of uh, uh, in, a, in front of a school. And um, I've already been working on it. I just you saw me do this one a little while ago and I'm playing this game finding pictures in the clouds <laughs> except in this case instead of clouds it's finding pictures in the blobs of paint okay so i just found a figure right there and finished art all of it so i've i've put some medium uh flesh tone color on my in fact it's a little bit too light want to darken a little bit by the way most of the time when i'm doing flesh tone i try intentionally to make it racially uh obscure so you really can't tell is that a black white brown person um i don't want people getting distracted by that so i usually make most of my i'll make a couple of them light a couple of them dark and the great majority when i'm doing a crowd of people and the great majority um hard to tell that's the way i want it to be anyway so i've got a, a you know a medium um skin tone here um painting with two hands helps because it helps keep you loose um, and, and at no single point, at no single point in this painting figure process, do I need to finish any one of these figures that, that would be premature. Does that make sense? Um, it's a, it's a, it evolves. The figures emerge slowly out of the mist. Uh, that's a good description of my entire painting process. Let me point out real quickly a composition issue, uh, a good, I think, a successful composition issue. Um, I know you're not seeing this entire painting. I'll move you up just a little bit, okay? You're, and now you're seeing most of it anyway. Um, I'm using Mikey's rule, which is three values, light, medium, and dark. 
Two of the three need to be contiguous. I'm saying this very quickly. I say it often. If you follow me, you'll hear it again. Mikey's rule, because I got it from Mike Rooney, my good buddy. I'm sure somebody invented He got it from somebody else, but he can't remember where. So I call it Mikey's rule. Um, three values, light, medium, and dark. Two of the three must be connected. So um, this is all mid-tone. Here's light area up here. All my lights basically are up here. They're contiguous. My darks are some here and some there. So the, my mid-tones need to be connected. And so for that reason, this is all mid-tone, mid, mid, mid. And I brought the mid-tone down enough so that it'll start connecting with this. This is going to be mid-tone. So this little isthmus <laughs> peninsula, I'm using a geographical, but this little isthmus of light is important to make this composition work better than it would than if there was like a, a dark, it used to be a dark area going right through here and divided up these two midtones. So I've connected those. Okay, now back to, back to painting figures. So I basically, I go back and forth and back and forth between light and dark. Now, because I'm painting a la prima right now, everything is, everything is wet. That means I can't paint the way I would much prefer. And that is by laying down layers of transparent color. In other words, this is, you can't do, once you're into wet oils, you can't do transparent color. Does that make sense? So it's a, a little bit opaque. Um, that's okay. It's the best I can do. It's as transparent as I can get. So let me switch here for a minute to some dark again. So I'm picking up some ultramarine, some dioxazine purple, and some oxide red, which of course is a brown. So I've got this dark stuff on my brushes. And it is um, mostly transparent, but as soon as I start messing with it on the canvas, it picks up the light stuff that's there. As I'm sure you, yeah, are you with me? Are you understanding? It picks up the light paint that's there and very quickly becomes opaque. But it, at least it's still it's dark, even though it's opaque. So I'm breaking a rule. If I'm if I'm doing dark paint on top of light that's break that, that's opaque i'm breaking a rule i'm going to probably mitigate i'm going to fix it by coming back and doing light areas in between and i'm getting too far off topic i'm just going to let that let that rest but that's for those of you who follow me off and you're going hey you're doing that thing you tell us not to do right 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 i am that's why every rule can be broken you have to have a good reason for breaking it and i right now i do so uh now i'm i'm sort of squinting or better yet i'll take my glasses off and I'm looking for shapes in here that look like people. Well, the people are pretty much already all defined. What I'm looking for at this point is arms and legs and things like that. Now, I've discovered that for myself, and I think it's pretty, probably pretty common, it, it left my own devices, that is to say, if I'm not careful, I make my figures uh, too stiff. As I jokingly say sometimes, I, I paint the guards at Buckingham Palace, if you catch my drift. I, I paint people standing at attention. And of course, this is a playground full of kids. So talk about kids that are not standing at attention. Kids on the playground are akimbo. I love that word, akimbo. Their, their, um, their joints are loose. Their appendages are flying. And keep your hands to yourself, right? <laughs> One of the mantras of the elementary school uh, season of our lives. Keep your hands to yourself. Why? Because kids don't keep them hand, their hands to themselves. They're poking, running, slapping, punching, hitting, pulling, etc., 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 etc. Are you with me? Um, so I want to make sure, like this one figure that I zoomed, that I did a little while ago right there, he's a little stiff. I mean, he's got his hands in his pockets, but, you know, and this leg's coming forward, but I don't want to have a whole playground full of, of kids that are that well behaved. It won't look like a playground full of kids if I do that. So, And the other thing, again, left to my own devices. That means if I'm not careful, if I don't watch out for this, um, I end up with the other expression is soldiers in a row. In other words, e uh, people like teeth on a comb, equidistant from each other. I'm in danger of that right in here. Do you see the, the spaces? between these people are a little bit too equal. Do you see that? A little bit too equal. So that the, the fix there is two things. One, if, if, that is, if that light stuff is wet paint, 
Then let's come in here and wipe it off. Yeah, it was mostly wet. So now I am don't have a lot of dark, and let's put a kid right in between these two. Are you with me? And of course, that is the way kids play. They bunch and they bunch and coagulate. <laughs> I love that word, coagulate. I got, that helped. I'm going to do that one more time somewhere maybe over here between these two. Are you with me? So you have to watch out for soldiers in a row. You do, when you're doing a crowd of people, you have to be careful that you don't end up with a, a bunch of people that are equally spaced. So there, I fixed that just a little bit. Change this guy's leg. I'm almost ready to go back to, um, yeah, I, I, I took a person out up here, and I think I'm going to put him back. I just about ready to go back to um, light, and so that's basically the way I do crowds of people. Dark light, dark light, and the light in this case is the negative painting, painting between the people. And once again, the whole time I'm playing the game of uh, pictures in the clouds, so to quote unquote. Um, looking for at the abstract shapes and and looking for what looks like a person or the par, a part of a person. Um, for instance, this looks like a a head down here, but is he's got a elephant man head. So let's carve that down to the right size. Probably the most common thing that I do is I'm in this stage uh, the negative painting. I'm carving down heads because again, left to my own devices, I'll make the heads too large. And my students, by the way, do that in spades. You know, left to their own devices, students always give their people watermelon heads. In fact, in my drawing class now, I've come to realize that when, when we're doing quick, quick um, uh, figure drawings, just to learn how to, how to draw. Like, I'll, you know, I, the, in my drawing classes, the students draw me, because I'm the figure that's there in the class, <laughs> fully clothed. I usually laugh and add that just to make sure they understand. Uh, so they draw me and then I draw them. Uh, most students, their default setting is they will draw the, the head first, which is a mistake usually. And secondly, they'll draw the head as a circle. Huge mistake. Do not draw the head as a circle. If you're going to start with anything, draw it as a rectangle. And it's a much better start. Much more likely to come out right than if you draw it as a circle. People do not have pumpkin heads which is what most students tend to draw. Again, as I say, left to their own devices. So I'm, I'm painting between people, looking for... You see, now, now that right there, this area, this right there just turned into a person coming toward us, and his left leg is bent. You see, so this one is straight, and that one's bent. That just happened sort of by accident. Um... I saw a mark there and said, ooh, that looks sort of like a bent leg. So I just accentuated it a little bit. And now it looks a little bit more like a person. So I go back and forth and back and forth. I'm really just about done. I, I, you know, I could continue this process on and on and on for higher degrees of realism. But uh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to get too realistic here, so I'm going to do some clothing. Now, you don't have to do what I do, but I have this habit, and it's just a routine of starting out with red clothing. Just as I did this one person right here, gave him a red shirt, that person right there. Um, for some reason, I find it easiest to, in a sense, go around the color wheel starting with red. The red stands out the most in most cases. Um... So I'm going to sort of strategically choose my red shirts and then I'll go around the color wheel one way or the other. Sometimes I go the purple direction and go around or sometimes I go the orange direction and go around. Does does not matter. Works either way. Here's a, here's a good example of a cone head. Do you remember that old funny TV show? Let me just take a, take a whoops, I can't erase it. That's, that's uh, not, it's dry paint. So I'm going to instead there so I just carved that person's head down this person over here doesn't even doesn't even have a body everything the only thing that we can see is a is a head but 
yeah, I'm going to give him a I'm going to give him a red body red shirt right now, and that will begin to look a little bit like a person. Um, I've got too many people facing us. Let me let me erase that. I want this person to be. I want us to be looking at this figure uh, side view. Okay, I've got in my crowd of people here. Got too many people facing us. So let's make sure we have some from the side. Okay, I'm going to go around the purple way. So I'm going to, without cleaning my brushes, I'm just going to pick up some dioxazine purple and carefully select some figures that look like they could be wearing purple. The purple shirts or purple shorts. The, <laughs> either one, except in America, blue jeans are so ubiquitous that you know, the majority of your casual crowds of people should have bluish legs and, and let's say have shorts on and they should have, you know, blue at the top and flesh, flesh at the bottom. Um, one more of this color. By the way, I'm also looking for colors that are already on the canvas, already on the painting. So I don't have to, like here's a person up here that already has sort of a, a, a dull raspberry tint to their clothing. So I'm just going to take that as a cue and amplify it slightly. Um, I'm going to wipe off the brush without, not, not clean it, just wipe it off. And let's continue on the color, color wheel. So I'm going to my um, ultraviolet blue with dirty brushes. So it's not a clean ultraviolet, it's a dirty ultraviolet. And um, Add a little bit of white to that, so it's a, what I have now is a very dull blue, almost a blue-gray. So I'm looking again, this would be good color for jeans or shorts. So let me come in here and do some short colors. Hey Doug, hey. Can, can you do a, is it a quick question? No. Can we squeeze it in? Come look at something like that. Okay, well, if you can do anything else while you're waiting for me, that'd be good, because I probably won't be here for another, I probably won't be done here for another several minutes. I don't know what else is going on, but I'll be there as soon as I can, okay? So there's some blue, and certainly want some blue shirts on some of these, this guy, person up here. probably want to come back and make sure I've got some long hair on some of these kids um, or it's gonna look like a boys school <laughs> so let's make sure I've got some long hair here and there I just picked up a, a brush that has flesh tone on it once again Wiping off this dull blue color. Let's, let's stay in blue for a little bit and we pick up some phthalo and white. So I have a much, much brighter blue now. And one of the things I'm going to do is come back and touch on the people that already had some blue. So I'm doing that principle, you know, of uh, doing a slightly lighter version of the color that's already there. But some people need just need this, this color shirt. This is not so much a blue jean color that I've got right now, so. Here's a fun one, by the way. This now looks like a person, but it's a person with no head, so. Let me. There we go. A little bit of a head, and then if I take uh, some brown, opaque, mid, mid pale brown, mid, mid light brown, and uh, do a smudge right there. That'll look Quite a bit like a person, maybe an arm. Where else? I've got three, four, that's enough blue. Let's graduate now to green. So are you following me? I'm going around the color wheel, and part of the reason just because it's it's more efficient, because I all I, I can wipe off my brushes and now pick up a green. I have a powerful sap green here. I think it's a Michael Harding color. Love Michael Harding paints. 
Okay, so again, it's I've got a, a kind of a dull, uh, dull green, not too much green. You know, green's not that. I don't think not that many people wear are wearing green in a crowd of people. So you want to be a little bit careful with the green, unless unless that's the you know the school color or something like that, the team color where there's a lot of green. Believe it or not, I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, and our most local university most is NC State University. And for that reason, there is an un, typically on a crowd, any crowd in Raleigh, there'll be a slightly higher degree of red clothing because that's North Carolina State's color. Green, okay, now coming around to yellow. Are you with me? I hope this isn't boring, uh, but again, the... Um, and again, not very many people are wearing yellow, so you really want to be careful of it. Maybe just one person right there. That's enough. Um, a little bit there. And the next, last thing is orange. I started with red. Are you with me? So you, again, you don't have to do this, but it's just a way that I, I have found to, to paint as efficiently as possible um, and get some kind of balance. Now, You'll notice that I haven't painted black or white clothing, and actually in real life there's always a ton of people wearing black, white, and gray. Um, I'll come back and do a little bit of that, but um, usually I want people in my painting to be slightly more colorful in their clothing, slightly more colorful than than real, than is, than is actual. Does that make sense? Whoops, I just picked up some phthalo X that I thought it was... I thought it was uh, ultramarine, so I'm adding purple to that. I'm trying to mix up a gray right now. My recipe for gray is usually ultramarine blue and, and oxide red. In other words, red and brown mixed together make gray when you mix white with it. And uh, you control the temperature of the gray by adding more blue or more brown. Okay, so I've got a, here now a fairly neutral gray. And then I'll come and hit, here's three people in a row, all wearing the same color at the moment. And that's right. I've got a little bit too much brown in my people group, so let's let's come in here. This guy was wearing purple, and now I'm switched into gray. Okay, that you've probably seen enough. I'm going to continue this process, dark light, dark light color, um, just little by little till I get these figures as realistic as I want them to be uh, and I'm close to finished already I do not want a lot of contrast on here as you can see it's pretty muted because this all has to be mid-tone it's not I don't want it to detract from the main part of the painting which is the school up here okay I'll sign off there uh, I don't know if I'll be doing another broadcast today or not I sort of doubt it but you never know. If I start doing something that I think is fun and teachable, I'll come back on. But that'll be the end of this, this particular broadcast. Okay? Thank you guys so much for watching. Again, subscribe, leave comments.